You're muted, Scott. No, still can't hear you. Okay, there we go. Just going to bypass the whole audio thing and put the microphone right in. Welcome to Dome at Home, everyone. Episode 11, what was going to be our penultimate uh, episode. This program was uh, running from January through March. And uh, so we're reaching the end of that time period. We have some news about that coming up a little bit later. We're going to be taking a look at the sky. We're going to be exploring the moon particularly. We uh, will also be taking a visit back to the first constellation that we ever featured on the show, Ursa Major. There's some really interesting things at this time of the year that we can draw to your attention. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, with me as always is Mike. He's there in the chat and he'll be moderating things, taking care of things. Uh, how, are, how are you today, Mike? I'm pretty good. Some lovely weather we're having out there and uh, some nice uh, night skies we're finally getting. And uh, yeah, I've even gotten used to the daylight savings time by now. Really? Oh man, I have been exhausted the entire week. Part of it is because of those clear skies. I've been up quite late every night looking at the stars and it's been... Uh, Beautiful. No aurora, but lots of stars. Had the binoculars out, had a telescope out one night, and it's been pretty sweet. So it's it's nice to get out under those stars for sure. Yeah. We, uh, I already see a question if we're going to be seeing George again. And yes, George will be making an appearance sometime in the uh, show. I uh, oh, I actually I actually see that uh, George is George has been brought down. He's he's a little more mellow today. Hey Georgie. Hey Georgie. Here's uh, daughter number two and George. Yes, Leo the lion, as we like to call him. I actually did take a picture of him crouching in a in a uh, position that will be perfect to um, make my own Leo the lion outline out of George. But I didn't have time this week. I spent too much time under the real sky, so that'll have to come next week. But we will have George as Leo the lion in our constellations uh, coming up shortly. All right. Let's get started with today's show. Um, first of all, we always like to acknowledge that uh, the program is supported by the Manitoba Safe at Home grant from the province of Manitoba. And as I said, that was funding that allowed us to do this show weekly from January through um, the end of March. Next week was supposed to be our last show because that's when the funding runs out. And of course, the museum is a not-for-profit. We have to decide exactly where we're going to spend all of our, all of our time and, and effort and things like that. I'm pleased to announce that we will, in fact, be extending the show. So season two of Dome at Home begins on the 1st of April and will run every Thursday through April, May and June. So we have uh, already made that decision. There are some other announcements to come along with that, but uh, it's nice to know that we'll be able to continue bringing the show to the folks here. We get so many great emails and uh, and messages from people that it will be available to everybody. And yes, Emma, it is going to be continue to be free. This is this is a a broadcast that we do for the community. It's it's not uh, we'd love it if you come down and buy a ticket and uh, you know or make a donation to the museum or things like that, but it's not required. It's uh, this is something that we do to build astronomers, not not to uh, build uh, anything else. Yeah, it's very exciting. So thanks for all the uh, the thanks, uh, the um, the congratulations coming in there in the chat. All right. So with that out of the way, we are going to be taking a look at um, some pretty interesting things today. We're going to start off as we as we always do. Um, my mentor, friend, hero, um, really mostly hero, um, Helen Sawyer Hogg, was the inspiration for. The theory behind this, the stars belong to everyone, and if that's true, then we should all have the ability to get to know those stars and find them ourselves and understand them. And, and so we'll be, uh, we will be doing the, um, basically following in her footsteps as we continue on in the show. We're also going to be looking at some very exciting uh, news. Oh, there's our, there's our little slide forgot about that. So Dome at Home Season 2 coming up. We will also be looking at um, some of the things that have happened in the past. One of the things that we often get questions about, you know, the, the, the moon landings. Well, those were 50 years ago. In fact, 
50 years ago, there was a lot of really cool stuff happening in the world of space. And it's kind of neat to look back and see some of these things from, from the old days. I mean, 50 years ago, we were launching Black Brant rockets from Churchill up into the Aurora to study the Northern Lights. They're still launching those rockets, not from Churchill anymore, but they're still launching those to try and figure out everything we can about the Northern Lights. I mean, 50 years ago, the Apollo 15 crew was training, getting ready for their mission. It was, it was going to be the, the fourth landing on the moon after uh, Apollo 11, 12, and 14, with, of course, the Apollo 13 not landing, but still having that, that epic adventure. And 50 years ago, and this is kind of a cool one, the very first space station ever, Salyut 1, was getting ready to be loaded onto the launch pad to go up. That, the very first space station with people living in space was uh, 50 years ago, coming up this month. It's kind of amazing. In some ways, 50 years is a really long time in terms of technology. And, you know, 50 years ago, they thought that 50 years in the future, we'd be living on Mars and we'd be flying to the planets and, you know, that kind of stuff. So a little bit slower than we thought. But then if you look at the length of human history, 50 years is nothing. I mean, we went from being stuck on one planet to being able to leave the planet and send robots to other places. I mean, that's pretty impressive for 50 years. Anyway, there's lots of uh, things coming up. Hey, go away. There's lots of things coming up from uh, other parts of, of history that we'll be taking a look at in coming episodes. The sky has been beautiful the last week, I would say. It's been warm, it's been clear, it's been new moon. The moon has been out of the sky mostly. So we've had this beautiful view of nice dark skies. Now I was not um, able to leave the city for most of my observing the last few days. I was sitting in the backyard um, in my suburban uh, house with absolutely no dark skies, but it was still amazing what I could see. I, I was tracking down Orion. I took some pictures of different things. It was, it was really a uh, wonderful few nights. And so let's take a look at the, the things that are visible at this time of the year. The northern sky, of course, we have... The northern sky, of course, there we go. We have all the same constellations we've been looking at. We've got, you know, the Big Dipper. It's getting higher and higher each night, but uh, it's becoming quite easy to see. Um, Nice and high, gets away from the trees and things like that. Cassiopeia, the, the W, has flipped all the way to the other side of the sky, and now it kind of looks like an upside-down number three. Still doesn't look like a queen on her throne to me. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, I just saw a couple of questions go by. Um, Northern light forecast is not great for tonight. I mean, you might see them. It's the kind of thing that could happen at any moment, but the forecast is not great. And yes, we do have a Mars rover update, uh, that will be coming up in uh, in cool space stuff uh, a little bit later on in the show. So the northern sky, like I say, the same kinds of constellations. Off in the west, we have the winter constellations that are starting to disappear. Here's the square of Pegasus. There's only one star left of the great square of Pegasus above the horizon after dark. Here's Andromeda really down low in the trees. We still got Perseus from that story that we were telling uh, in the winter. But even things like Taurus the Bull. Oh, and we actually we had, um, I think it was uh, Ulrich sent us a great drawing. He was out with his binoculars and he looked at Aldebaran and Mars. And then he saw a lot of the stars in the Pleiades star cluster and he drew a picture of what it was. And it was actually a pretty, pretty faithful reproduction of the, um, sorry, the Hyades star cluster. Really, uh, really interesting to see, um, you know, how many things you can see in just a pair of binoculars. The moon is right over there tonight, and in fact, as it gets darker, you can already see the moon, but as it gets darker, both Mars and Aldebaran will pop in there. Now, one of the things that I've been playing around with is that we have um, several telescopes and several um, cameras that we can use, and so I set one up out in the backyard, and if I can get this switched over, we'll have nice live... Here we go. Here's uh, live images of the moon from my backyard. They're not great images right now because they're coming off the wireless and they're also, um, you know, it's still bright outside. So the sky is not terribly bright. 
when it gets darker tonight i'm going to go back out there and we'll we'll take another look and hopefully see uh see a better view and i'll put some of that onto facebook as well but we will be doing some live observing now that the weather's warmer now that we've got this capability we will be doing more and more live stuff in dome at home in the coming weeks and months okay off in the south we still have i mean orion the hunter is dominating the sky belt of three stars beetlejuice and um rigel the bright stars in there we've talked about the two hunting dogs canis major down here with sirius the brightest star in the sky canis minor up here with procyon i think it's the fourth or fifth brightest star in the sky but not much of a constellation this little group of stars in between here this is called monokeros which is the unicorn does not look like a unicorn in fact the stars are so faint it does not look like much of anything yeah i, Scott, I agree sorry to it. interrupt uh, yeah. can you uh, highlight your screen we're not seeing uh, your picture we're seeing the moon live moon oh video. that is very strange i did that but i guess it did not remove spotlight there we go and we'll spotlight this one there, you there go. we go thank you mike one of the many reasons we have mike on the other end of the magic box here is to make all of the technology work so all right um so yeah we as as i said we have you know orion we have canis major and canis minor in the middle here we have uh monokeros this is the unicorn no idea how that's a unicorn but again really really faint stars got put into sort of the leftover constellations so i think seeing the unicorn in the sky is only a little bit easier than seeing an actual unicorn out there in the wild somewhere the east is where the the action is in some ways because that's where the new constellations are rising up the constellations of spring are all rising we talked about leo the lion over here it's getting nice and high we've got a few other spring constellations this is cancer the crab here we'll move just a, a little bit so we can see it quite faint here there's a long rambling constellation underneath this is hydra the snake it's pretty hard to see i mean the stars are not particularly faint but they're spread apart and they're kind of all over the place so the only thing that really pops out to my eye is this little group the head here there's kind of this little parallelogram with a little thing sticking out of it this actually stands out pretty well and it's sort of down below cancer and off to the off to the right of leo so you might notice that it fits nicely in a pair of binoculars to see those those stars as well and then rising up we're going to see more of the spring constellations constellations like this is virgo the maiden over here is arc uh the bright star arcturus in the constellation of boates the herdsman or the ice cream cone as we usually call it and then other ones like here's canis venetici the hunting dogs and over here we have um coma berenices the hair of bernice they were really stretching for some of these constellations anyway um the eastern sky is really where the the new constellations are coming up and what's cool about this part not so much for using your unaided eye but for people with binoculars and telescopes it turns out that this region in behind leo and down by virgo and coma berenices there are hundreds of other galaxies in this part of the sky you'll need a telescope to see most of them you might see a couple of them in in very powerful binoculars but they are really a treat to check out and that's uh we'll do we'll do a feature on the the virgo galaxy cluster because that's actually basically part of our home we're basically a member of that of that area of the universe in the sort of cosmic sense so we'll talk about that in the future but that's kind of cool to know that off in that direction there are hundreds and hundreds of other galaxies each one as big as the milky way all right straight up and this is for the folks that have buildings or trees or whatever around straight up you have a couple of things we've got capella this bright star in origa the charioteer where we talked about origa a couple of weeks back origa looks like a pentagon there is no chariot it's just the charioteer so i don't know how you distinguish between a charioteer and just some guy uh, and the charioteer is carrying three little goats and that's what these little triangle are here we had um, email from a few folks that said they were able to spot the goats in the sky they actually jump out 
pretty nicely because it's a nice little triangle of bright stars right next to Capella. And then similarly nearby, we have Gemini, the twins, also nice and high in the sky. So that gives us a good view of, um, of that constellation. So you're looking straight up for there. Okay, I see a lot of questions have gone by. Can we uh, take a couple of questions there, Mike? What do you have for... Yeah, I don't know if you can just quickly scroll to Brooke's question. She just put it in there, and oh, okay. it's actually a, a really good question. That uh, There's a couple of questions in there that maybe you could touch upon. I was yeah, just sure, about to sure. type up an answer. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, actually, and I, and I saw Lesia's uh, question go by a couple of times, um, so we'll get to that one uh, as well. So uh, Brooke asks, are the major or most famous constellations considered major because of their visibility in the sky? Or are there other reasons as to why Orion, the Big Dipper, etc., are the major constellations? Um, and then there's a couple of other questions uh, that we'll get to in a minute. The questions are, or the constellations are things that we made up. They're not in any way, the stars in the constellation are not related to each other. They might be at different distances. Like for this, for example, the stars in the Big Dipper, five of the seven stars are all about the same distance. And then this one here, uh, this one here at the end is like twice as far away. It just happens to be in the same direction from us here on Earth. So the constellations are really artificial things. So they become famous or major, I guess, either because they're connected to a famous story or because they're easy for people to find. So, for example, the constellation Hercules is not really that easy to find, but it's connected to a very famous person from mythology, and so most people have heard of Hercules. Orion is pretty easy to find. You know, if we're looking at, at the, the uh, constellation of Orion, it's got so many bright stars in it that it's just, it's kind of hard to miss when it's above the horizon. Now, there is one group of, of constellations that is famous for a very specific reason. The constellations of the Zodiac the 12 constellations that are used for horoscopes and all that kind of stuff, those are important constellations in the actual sky because that's where the moon and the planets like Mars go through. So, for example, this is Taurus the Bull, and right now Taurus the Bull has Mars in it and also has the moon in it tonight. And then if we wait till tomorrow, the moon and Mars will both have moved a little bit, and then the following night... The moon will move on a little bit more. It's close to us, so it looks like it's moving faster. And then the moon moves on into the next zodiac constellation, which happens to be Gemini the Twins. So that's why those ones became famous. And it, it's sh certainly not because they were all bright constellations. Think, there are some zodiac constellations that are really hard to see, really faint. Um, so that's kind of why the constellations became famous and so on. Um, and so the changes in the constellations, um, which was the rest of the other part of your question, basically the season, the seasons of constellations change because the earth is slowly moving around the sun. And so when we're looking in one direction and the sun's in the way, it's daytime. So we don't think about the constellations and the only constellations we can see is when the earth spins away from the sun and we're looking, you know, away from the sun into the darkness and that's where we see those constellations and as the earth goes around the sun the direction that darkness is points in different directions at different seasons so basically you wind up looking at different parts of the universe at nighttime at different seasons um so i think that kind of uh kind of does it um Somebody says, oh, Audrey says, didn't they become important because of sea navigation? Yeah, certain bright stars were used for navigation. And so they were beca they became more known, um, certainly by sailors. Um, and things like the North Star, for example, that anyone can use to find your directions. But there are some stars that would be learned for, for those kinds of things. But that became less and less sort of common knowledge. Like the farmers would also know a lot of stars. They'd know when certain stars were rising just in the morning, they would know basically what time of year it was. Now, uh, Lysia, you were talking about the Seven Sisters, and uh, that's part of constellation of Taurus the Bull. Let's, let's just zoom in here a little bit. Here's Taurus the Bull with the face of the bull. Mars is right there right now, and this is the Seven Sisters. It looks like a little dipper-shaped cluster of stars, and if we zoom right in there, you can really start to see a little bit more of a view. There we go. So you have this 
this kind of cluster of six bright stars. And so most people actually will see six stars. Some people will see eight stars. Almost no one sees seven stars, it turns out. Um, because star number seven and star number eight are both about equally difficult to see. So either you see six or you see eight. Actually, I see like three because my vision is not very good. I see three and a blur, but that's okay. You know, in a pair of binoculars, it really jumps out. Very, very nice uh, view. Uh, oh, hey, Keith. I got a question from Keith Hirtani, which is somebody that uh, wrote into us. And uh, Keith and I, way back in the day, worked together uh, at, I think, my very first job. So that was, uh, it was great to, great to connect. Um, Keith's asking if I'd seen the Southern Cross or other Southern Hemisphere constellations. Um, the farthest south that I've been when I was sort of into astronomy is uh, southern Texas. And so from there, you can just barely start to see um, some of the southern constellations. I wasn't there at the time of year when the Southern Cross was up. So I've not seen the Southern Cross. Although, of course, at lunchtime, I just go into the planetarium and I can, you know, see anything I want. But I haven't seen the real thing yet. One day, I'll get down there and, and be able to see the Southern Cross because that's sort of a, uh, a bucket list thing for me, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's jump back to our sky here. I did want to point out, it is a really good night to look at the moon because it is close to the Seven Sisters. It's close to the um, planet Mars. Oh, let's just jump back to tonight. There we go. It actually is a nice little photo op. If you have, uh, have a camera, you can go out and get the moon here, get the... Uh, planet Mars. The moon's not actually full like that. It just shows full until I zoom in. So we've got this beautiful uh, crescent moon. Not quite half, but getting there. Last night it was a beautiful little... My, my wife says it looks like a toenail. I, I prefer banana or croissant or something like that, but she says it's a toenail. Whatever. You can think of it however you want. Changes every night. And last night was a beautiful view. And right now is also a beautiful view. I'm coming back to the moon here because we have started talking a little bit about binoculars and using binoculars. As uh, you may remember from last week, telescopes are really hard to get. Pretty much the entire world is sold out of telescopes right now because so many people have decided, you know, when they're staying at home, well, let's pick up a new hobby and a good backyard hobby is astronomy. You don't need a telescope to do that though. If you have regular binoculars, um, or if you don't, those are fairly easy to get from any hardware store or some camera stores or things like that. You have the, um, basically two telescopes, one for each eye. They're easy to use. They're nice and light. They don't have so much magnification that you have to point really accurately to, to hit your target. They're showing you a big chunk of sky. So they're very, very nice to use. And so each week we'll be featuring something you can check out in binoculars. And this particular week, it will be the crescent moon. The moon, I mean, I think we've talked about, you know, super moons before and things like that. And you know my feelings on the super moon, but the moon is always super if you are looking through a telescope or binoculars. This is the moon tonight. And there are, you know, you can see the dark areas that are nice and flat. Then the, the lighter areas are kind of more raised. And then all of these round craters start to become visible in um, a good pair of binoculars. And especially right along what we call, it's called the terminator. It's the line between light and dark. It's basically where the sun would be rising or setting on the moon if you were standing there. You can really see, because of all the shadows, it really makes the, the terrain jump out. You can see the dark um, bottoms of craters and then the the far rim is getting lit up but the bottom of the crater is still in nighttime if you've lived in the mountains you're familiar with seeing the mountain tops sort of get hit by the pink light long before the the sun shines down into the valleys below everything on the moon is named uh and some of the big features that you can see in binoculars are, are called seas the the first stargazers thought oh the moon it's just like the earth and so those must be lakes and oceans and things like that because they're flat not so much. They're just flat lava plains, but they're named after all sorts of entertaining things. Technically, they're named in Latin, you know, because everyone uses Latin for things. But 
I tend to stick with the English versions. Uh, the Sea of Serenity is just starting to appear here. Sea of Tranquility, probably the most famous location on the moon. Uh, the Sea of Nectar, I don't know what, what's up with that. Um, and the Sea of Fertility and the Sea of Crisis, Crises. I think that's, uh, that's, my, uh, that's my spot on the moon there, it seems, bouncing from one crisis to another. R tonight, right along the Terminator, you can see two of the Apollo landing sites. Now, okay, you can't see the lunar landers, the footprints, any of that stuff. That's way too small. The smallest thing you can see on the moon with a pair of binoculars is probably a kilometer across. You know, you might be able to see a gigantic shopping mall as a tiny little dot. So that's the kind of scale that you can basically see. But the locations, right in the middle there, basically, right on the edge of the, of the uh, Terminator, that's where Apollo 11 landed the first landing on the moon. And Apollo 17, the most recent landing on the moon, was just up a little farther along the crescent there. There's a beautiful crater here called Theophilus. I don't know who Theophilus actually is. I think he's probably some Greek or um, philosopher or scientist or something from long ago. I should know that. But this crater really stands out at this, at this phase because the shadow fills in the crater, but then the mountain that's in the center of the crater is sticking up high enough that the sun hits it and it kind of looks like a bullseye. It's a beautiful sight. So if you get a chance, definitely try and check that out. When you start looking at the moon up close, you really start to see that the shadow changes over time very, very quickly. If you look at the moon, um, if you look at the moon and then look at it again an hour later, the, sh the shadows will have changed enough that right along the Terminator here, things will be different. You know, you may see, for example, these little dots over here that are just the highest part of peaks. And then an hour later, you may see that they're all joined together because they're actually a crater rim or something like that. I think this is a crater right here and you're only seeing the peaks lit up, but an hour from then you'll actually see the... Um, the um, whole crater. And similarly here, you've got um, the central peaks of some craters here. There is a couple of really interesting times on the moon where you get an interesting effect. And you might already see right in the center here, these two crater rims that are intersecting here, it basically looks like there's a letter X on the moon. And if you're, if you're looking at the moon in a telescope, and you're, coming, you're, you're looking at all these craters and suddenly you see like X marks the spot. It really kind of jumps out and shocks you because you're not expecting to see letters on the moon. You're expecting to see, you know, geography. So there's a, it's, it's called the lunar X. It's actually only visible for about four hours every month. And it turns out that on March the 20th, basically right at sunset, it should be visible. So if you've got a pair of binoculars or you've got a small telescope, on March the 20th, go out, find the moon. It's pretty easy to find. And look right along the Terminator and see if you can see this little bright X jumping out at you. There are a couple of other similar kinds of effects that happen on the moon, but that's probably the, no the best known one. And it does take a little planning to see. Kind of a challenge for, uh, for most people. It's pretty easy to see in a telescope if you go out at the same time, at the right time. If you Google Lunar X, first of all, you'll find great images like this. Um, you'll also find a chart for the entire year that tells you um, exactly when to look each month. And I'm seeing people are typing in that uh, Theophilus is uh, from uh, the, the title of the, the person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, Greek for friend of God. Thank you. I knew, I, I knew the Theo had to be in there somewhere, but uh, thanks for filling that in. I'm terrible with names, even... 2000 year old ones. So all, all of those things, a pair of binoculars can help you to explore the moon. If you do have a telescope, great. If you don't, still using your binoculars or even just using your eye, make some drawings and then go back the next night, make some drawings uh, as well, or an hour later. Things really change really quickly. And it's pretty cool to actually watch sunrise creep across the moon and see these peaks sort of appear out of nowhere. It's, it's really impressive. Okay, since we're talking about the moon, I wanted to wish, uh, normally we say happy birthday to various people. This week, we're going to say happy birthday 
to um, happy 150th birthday to Dr. Reginald Daly. Reginald Daly was actually a geologist who got involved in astronomy, and he was the first person to propose that the moon was not formed with the Earth, and it was not an object that was passing by and was captured by its gravity, but he proposed that the moon was actually formed from the debris from a collision with another object. That's the kind of thing that back in 1946 or so when he proposed it, that was ridiculous. People just didn't think that that could be possible. If something big hit the earth, how would that form a moon? Isn't it more likely that, you know, two things had just formed together or something? He was able to do some of the math to show that that was not the case. And now with supercomputers, we're able to simulate these kinds of collisions because we understand gravity and we understand how rocks work and what temperature they melt at and so on. And so if you have a glancing collision with the early Earth and another planet, probably about the size of the current planet Mars, not the actual planet Mars, but something that size, there were probably a few of these larger planets that were all forming in the same general area of the solar system the collision would have completely melted the entire surface of the Earth. And so that's how we know this happened a long time ago, because we can see a lot of really old rocks on the Earth, and they don't show evidence of having everything been melted. So we think that this would have happened very early in the Moon's history. And basically you have this massive collision that gives you a big melted Earth, another object of sort of lumped off the side, and then a huge cloud of material orbiting around the Earth. In fact, essentially, the Earth had a ring around it for some thousands of years after this event. It would take a long time for the Earth to cool down from that impact. Obviously, everything on the surface, you know, it melts, all the heavy stuff sinks down, and that's one of the explanations for why all the heavy elements have to be mined out of the ground deep down rather than just being lying all around on the surface. That's why you can't just walk around and find nickel and lead and all that kind of stuff, but it has to be dug out. It's also an explanation for why the Earth and the Moon have such similar compositions. If you analyze the rocks, if you look at the isotopes and do all sorts of science to sort of figure out where these rocks came from, they're very, very similar. But the moon does not have a lot of the heavy elements. It just has the lighter stuff. And so that's kind of weird. How could these things be the same except one of them doesn't have the heavy stuff? It, it didn't make a lot of sense. This impact theory that Reginald Daly came up with, um, and by the way, he's Canadian. He's from Napanee, Ontario, and uh, went to U of T, U of Toronto, and then off to uh, some little university called Harvard spent most of his career there but uh, this was one of his early suggestions and it, he just sort of threw it out there as a as a hey I think this is what happened and then he just sort of dropped it he didn't they didn't have supercomputers they couldn't do this kind of of work so he just sort of said yeah that's it other astronomers and geologists picked up the idea and started working with it and doing more studying and you know figuring out the implications and looking for the evidence so you you wind up with an earth and a ring and a moon all going around each other and eventually of course all the material in the ring would eventually spiral in towards the earth under gravity and disappear and then you know you wind up with just the earth and the moon and then the earth and the moon were all hit with all sorts of rocks uh, making the craters and things like that throughout the rest of their history so this would have happened really 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 early so reginald was the guy that came up with that and it's pretty impressive because it's really outside the box thinking no one had there was no reason to think that this kind of thing was common in the solar system with big impacts like this um, and to be honest, we don't see it in other places. Like, why didn't that happen to Venus? Why doesn't Venus have a moon? Because it almost certainly got hit with things as well. All sorts of really cool things from uh, Mr. Reginald. So happy 150th birthday. We, uh, we couldn't possibly afford the rights as a not-for-profit to sing happy birthday. And so we'll just say it. And that's, uh, that's where we'll go with that. All right. 
we're going to move. Oh, um, somebody was asking, if a big body like that hit the earth, what would we feel? You wouldn't feel anything. Everybody would just be dead. Sorry to be so blunt, but basically some an impact like that is not the kind of thing that is survivable. Essentially, if the entire planet melts, that's that's bad day. Luckily, all of those things, all those big things that were going to hit planets, most of them have already hit things over the last four billion years or so. And so there's very, very few objects that are out there still on collision courses. And most of them are quite small. There's nothing the size of Mars that can hit anything anymore. In fact, there's, there's very few objects that can hit things. And most of them are in the few kilometers across instead of like 2000 kilometers across. Now, a few kilometers across would still ruin your day, but it's not the kind of thing that, you know, sci-fi has told us that we can eventually deal with those kinds of asteroids, right? Um, oh, Lou is asking what observations led Daly to his theory. I'm not really sure. I didn't have time to go. Uh, he's got a, a really cool um, set of memoirs that I want to check out, but uh, I, I haven't had a chance to do that. I think basically he, he just was unsatisfied with the existing theories and was trying to come up with some other idea of how these things could have happened. And there's, there's a lot, if you're familiar with the conservation of angular momentum, the Earth and the Moon are very unusual um, in terms of the way their angular momentum is set up. And so he thought that some kind of glancing blow from this, you know, you needed to get a lot of rotation going. So he thought that that might be the only way to do that. I, so that's probably where it came from. But that math is above my, above my head. Okay, connect the dots, our constellation segment. We're, we're back to Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. We covered this in the very first show. It's probably the most common constellation. I covered it first off because you kind of can't talk about the sky without talking about the Big Dipper. So we did it right off the top. We're revisiting it now because in the spring, it's really when it's coming into its own and it's a great time to, uh, to observe. So the Big Dipper is, you know, the seven stars. You add more stars and you wind up with the Big Bear. We've explained the issues with this. This does not look like a bear. This is the bear's nose and its body and then its long tail, which bears on Earth do not have. And then its long legs, which bears on Earth do not have. This doesn't really look like a bear at all. There are ways of drawing the constellations that put the nose at this end, but the way these stars are named, it's actually clear that this is where the nose is supposed to be. So kind of a mystery why people came up with that. Other groups have actually looked at the constellation, though, and given it different names. I mean, we, we don't have to follow the ancient Greeks um, with their bear. If you look at some of the uh, people in northern Canada, the Inuit see it as a caribou, and it circles around the North Pole. So that's a, a sort of a different view. And actually, it sort of puts the, the neck and head in a more usable position, I think. The Anishinaabe people, uh, as I mentioned uh, once before, call this the fisher, and a fisher is kind of like a weasel. And so the, the fisher is up there and, it, you know, with short legs and a long body, it kind of kind of makes sense. Now, we're working on bringing someone in who can uh, spend a little bit more time telling some of the Anishinaabe sky tales and things like that. We're, you know, I'm not really the right person to to talk about that. The planetarium has been gifted some star stories from um, Anishinaabe elders. We're only allowed to tell them in full when there is snow on the ground because the um, agreement that we have is that we're only allowed to tell those stories when the spirits are resting and that is only when there's lots of snow on the ground. So we're not allowed to get into all the details. Um, so we, we won't spend too much time on this. The, the story is actually related to the seasons, though. And what I love about the story is that it explains the position of the Big Dipper in the sky, explains why we have the four seasons. And so our poor Fisher actually winds up getting shot with an arrow to take him up into the sky. But he's carrying a secret bag that contains summer. And so one day we'll be able to tell that full story. But suffice it to say, at this time of the year, 
the Big Dipper or the Fisher is high up in the sky. And so the Bag of Summer is high up in the sky and starting to pour its bounty down onto the land and things start to warm up. As the year goes on, Fisher will get even higher and higher in the sky, be almost right overhead. And that is the sign that we will have nice warm weather. So again, there's, there's more to the story. We'll, we'll bring someone on to tell that story in full at the appropriate time. But many of these constellation tales try to explain the workings of the sky and also the coming of the seasons, the, the timing, the relationship between the stars and what happens here on Earth. And things like horoscopes and zodiac stuff, they were trying to do the same thing in a, in a less direct way, I guess. But we've always tried to connect what's happening in the sky with what's going on here on the Earth and try to find guidance in the stars. And so we can we can use the stars for guidance. We can find the North Star to find our directions. We can tell time with the stars and things like that. What else can the stars tell us? That was sort of the quest. And so it's not surprising that people have always looked at the stars for that kind of guidance. Now, I'm not gonna do horoscopes or, or things like that, but like I say, we'll, we'll uh, now that we know that we have season two coming up, we're gonna be doing all sorts of interesting things for, uh, for our constellation tales for the rest of that. Oops, wait, wait, forgot this. Cool space stuff. Oh, uh, what happened to my voiceover? Wait, did the voiceover not? Oh, you know what? I had to turn off the audio because we were having that microphone problem. Sorry, Mike. Can you do it live? Yeah, of course I can. Okay, okay, let's go. Cool space stuff. Nice. Okay, we'll uh, we'll just beatbox it next time. No, no, we won't. That was good. All right. Um, there we go. Here is some of the latest imagery from the Mars Perseverance rover, Percy. Some really good news. First of all, it works. It's driving around. It's taking pictures. It's got pictures of its own tracks and things like that. And it's sending these, there, there are tens of thousands of pictures that have already been sent back. And, you know, a color picture like this often takes several different pictures being put together and so on. So you can actually see all of the, the raw images quite well um, on the Mars 2020 website. You can see them basically as soon as they come down. The resolution's amazing. I mean, this is a zoom in of one of those shots and you can see basically the, the smallest things you can see there are almost grains of sand, like a millimeter across or so. So it's almost like being there. We do know that the helicopter is getting ready to fly. They have charged it up. They know that it's um, communicating and they have even picked a spot where they're going to drop it off. On Tuesday, NASA is doing a press conference and they will be revealing sort of the plans. And the idea is that um, once, they, once they drop it off, they have about a 30 day window that the thing's batteries will still be good for. And so it'll have 30 days to do its various test flights. They're saying though, not before April 1st. So I am thinking that that will be a season two thing for us, but we will definitely follow the Ingenuity helicopter as it flies, goes for its first flight on Mars. Pictures like this just kind of blow me away. This is about the height of an average person. If you were standing on Mars, this is basically what the view would be like. The, the arm there on the left stands up to, you know, about six feet off the ground. And so, you know, it's, it's this is Mars. We're, we're there. You know, we're, we're not quite walking around on it, but it is a very um, familiar looking landscape. It doesn't look all that different than some of the deserts here on Earth. And there was just a, a recent paper came out saying that hmm, maybe maybe all the water on Mars, it didn't evaporate away. It actually just soaked down into the soil. Maybe it's still there somewhere. And that would be really interesting to find out. Percy is going to be doing some drilling and uh, maybe that will help um, reveal whether that's uh, the case or not. Um, let's see. Oh, um, Leslie was asking about the, the time for, um, the time for the NASA press conference. I think it's 1130 on Tuesday, but I forget which time zone that was. So I'll have to check, 
But if you if you just go to the NASA 2020 website, it's basically their lead story. They're really excited about it and they want to make sure that everybody knows. So you should be able to find it there. Um, and uh, Brooke is asking, what is your prediction as to what your people would be on Mars? 30 years from now. It's always 30 years from now. It was 30 years from now when I was a kid. It was 30 years from now when I was, you know, 30. And it's 30 years from now now. I it's such an expensive and such a risky trip. I don't really see it happening anytime soon because there are so many competing things. And quite frankly, the, the robots that are going are getting more and more sophisticated and more and more um, able to do the job. And that's kind of happening a lot with human spaceflight. I mean, you've got um, robot arms and you've got robots on the International Space Station that are sort of taking over for some of the spacewalks and things like that. So I don't think there's going to be a big push to go right away. So once, you know, maybe some technology breakthroughs will will uh, push things along or maybe some of the private companies, you know, you've got uh, SpaceX talking about going to Mars, but they're talking about taking a million people to Mars. Yeah, that's not going to happen anytime soon. They So far, they've been able to take four people to the space station. So, you know, there's a lot of cool ideas. There's a lot of excitement, and that's really important. But I'm not sure when it's actually going to gonna occur. Uh, Wesley was asking, is this the actual color? Yeah, this is pretty much a true color view of Mars. So it's not actually as bright red as we often picture it. It's kind of like a tawny brown, rusty kind of color. Speaking of the International Space Station, there was some spacewalks happening the last couple of days. The space station needs maintenance. And in fact, you, uh, just like your car, you got to change the battery every once in a while. You got to go out and swap out cables and put on windshield wipers or whatever. Same thing in the space station. And so they were doing this spacewalk. One of the interesting things is that they had finally filled up one of their garbage pallets. You know, you, it's like those big blue bins outside of an apartment building. You fill it up, fill it up, fill it up, and then they come and take it away. Well, there's no one to come and take it away, so they just threw it overboard. And so they, they dumped something like, a, I think it was almost three tons of a pallet that will basically be a single unit that will just go around the earth for a little while and eventually spiral in and burn up in the atmosphere. Um, three tons being thrown overboard seems kind of risky to me. We're, we're quite concerned about what's going on with, uh, with Earth orbit being, you know, polluted. But I guess you got to deal with it somehow. So I'll have to look more into that um, to see what other options there, there could have been. But uh, it does seem that, you know, that's, a, that's not a great way to, to sort of deal with things, I would say. The last bit of news in cool space stuff, Russia has come out and said, yay, we're going to go to the moon too, but they're not going to take the Americans' invitation and join the Artemis program. They are going to join with China. And so rather than um, sort of one international coalition from Earth going to the moon, there will be two, not necessarily competing, but two different versions. There's the United States with NASA and then um, the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency is sort of partnering into that. And then you've got China and Russia. And whereas the Artemis program will build a space station around the moon and then go up and down to the surface uh, fairly regularly, the Chinese-Russian plan is to go right to the surface and to build a moon base. Kind of like the, the South Pole base that Russia has maintained down at the South Pole for, for many years. This image looks really, really kind of familiar for that. If anybody watched uh, the movie The Thing, you know that South Pole base? That's the one, yeah. If you're a kid, don't watch that movie. It's far too scary. But uh, anyway, the it, it, it's a little unfortunate that there'll be this competition. But on the other hand, sometimes competition is good. If, um, if you know, people are competing to sort of be the first there or whatever, it might speed things up a bit. We'll have to see. We don't know, though, if the American plan, the Artemis mission, is actually going to go ahead because they're reviewing their big rocket and they have some budget problems and some political issues and things like that. We're going to have to see. I was really excited last month that we were going to the moon. Now I'm a little bit more cautious. We'll have to see if it gets pushed off a little bit. But you don't have to wait. 
you can go to the moon tonight. You can go outside and look at the moon right now and just see what things look like. Oops, I didn't want to do that. There we go. Yes. I really need a third monitor. I think that's my problem here. So you can go to the moon, go outside, check it out with binoculars, check it out with your naked eye, check it out with the telescope, whatever you happen to have. And we are glad that we will be back here. Um, oh, I see a question that came up. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, we will be back here next week. And then we will be starting season two on April the 1st. So thank you all for all of your support. For those of you that have been watching the show regularly, we really appreciate it. We love hearing from you. It really helps to tell our boss to, um, you know, show how many people we're reaching and all the fun that you're having and stuff like that. We will be back um, next week with, uh, let's see, what do we got on tap? We've got the constellation of Boates. We've got the 25th anniversary of one of the best comets ever seen on Earth. And we have more cool space stuff because I'm hoping we'll know more about the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, if uh, people are interested, I will be um, trying to use the telescope right around nine o'clock tonight. Uh, you can join me on my personal Facebook page, which is Scott the Skywatcher, and I'll stream through there. And uh, so you can join us there from nine to 9.30. Otherwise, we'll see you again next week. Thank you all for joining us. You know what? We forgot to mention the equinox is coming. It's not really a big deal. It's not totally related to the weather. It's an astronomical definition of spring and so on. But you know what? Um, the weather is a better indicator. I think spring is already here. Thanks again, everyone. And we will see you all next week. Have a wonderful